Hey, how's it going? My name is Tom Cassidy. You're watching the Distortions YouTube channel. Today we're going to be covering some tips and tricks when you're doing a large sculpture, something kind of like this. Now the number one thing that you want to keep in mind is you want to sculpt it out of clay. If this was sculpted out of marble, well it would take forever and we'd never be able to get the plaster mold off of it. So do it out of clay. Now all seriousness aside, the number one thing you're going to be fighting when you're doing a large sculpture like this is gravity and the weight of the clay. Wet clay in particular is pretty heavy. We'll do our armature. In this case, there's a lot of two by fours and stacked wood underneath here, creating kind of shelves and places for the clay to lock onto. That on its own isn't enough. Because if you imagine it like this, here's your shelf for the armature, here's your soft wet clay. Well, gravity is gonna make it start doing that and eventually slip off. So what we'll do is we'll take either old clay or new clay, it's up to you. We just like to recycle when we can and we'll put it onto the armature and really beat it on there. You know, use a two by four or something to really get it into every nook and cranny and we'll spray it with a little bit of water to create more of a vacuum. And then we'll set that down, we won't cover it up and we'll let it sit for 12 to 24 hours depending on the thickness. And what that does is that clay will firm up and start to go into the leather hard state. So here's your armature, here's your clay, the clay isn't soft anymore and it's not going anywhere. And we typically will give ourselves, you know, an inch or two of working room from that point. But having that hard clay core is essential to making sure that this sculpture doesn't fall down the table. When you're doing a big sculpture like this, another key thing to keep in mind is not rushing through the large anatomy and not rushing through the shapes. I and a lot of other sculptors have a tendency to want to get to the detail, to get to the fun parts, you know, put the, the veins and the wrinkles and the folds on there. But the only issue with that is you can, uh, you can have the most brilliantly detailed and textured sculpture in the world. It can be beautiful, but if the base anatomy isn't right, then it's always gonna look off. And that's something that I myself have a problem with. I love to try and rush through it. And it's a good thing that we have Ed here, and this is another thing. Um, you want to have a second set of eyes to be able to look at your sculpture. When you've stared at it for long enough, you will start not being able to see the imperfections as well and what's off. But when you bring in a fresh set of eyes that hasn't seen it before, they might be able to notice what's off. Maybe the nose is a little too long. Maybe the pectoral muscles are a little too narrow or aren't connecting in exactly the right place. And this is another time where it is great to get a second set of eyes on the sculpture. When you've been looking at something for so long, it starts to become just kind of ingrained in your mind and you start not being able to see what is wrong with it as well. It doesn't matter if they're an artist or not. Like I said, we're looking at human faces all the time. So if your friends tells you the nose seems a little long, maybe the nose seems a little long. So here I'm working on the large anatomy. And like I said earlier, this is one of the most important parts, so I spend a lot of time on this. 75 to 80% of the sculpture is the anatomy. Be sure to recognize that this sculpture, or any large sculpture, is going to get heavy. This one in particular, between the clay and the table, weighs about 500 pounds. Don't be overconfident and think that you can move something on your own if you can't. You don't want to injure yourself. Get a second set of hands to help you set it down or lift it up. That'll bring us to our next very vital step, is reference. Now, I consider myself a bit of a lazy sculptor here. I don't have enough reference on my board here. I've got enough to get me by. But if you're doing this at home, spend a couple hours going through the internet or going through books and look for the exact right reference. You know, you want to get the pose that you're going for, the exact body type or the exact proportions, because that will help immensely. We might think that we know what, say, uh, you know, an oblique muscle looks like. Up until this sculpture, I really had no idea what an oblique muscle looks like. And, you know, that's kind of ridiculous. So it's good to have and that it, it's good to have anatomical reference, especially so you can see how those shapes interact with each other and where the muscles connect. Because again, 
It doesn't matter how beautiful the detail is. If the anatomy isn't right, the sculpture's never gonna look right. And as I'm laying in the veins and the muscles on the face and a lot of the more secondary forms and more subtle stuff, that's when you really want to start paying attention to your reference because veins, although they have variants, grow in very specific patterns. There are going to be certain veins on the chest that only grow in one direction or one way. And if they're going the wrong way or coming from the wrong place, even though it's small and it's subtle, your eye will be able to tell you it's off because we understand human anatomy. We look at it every single day. You'll notice here that I cut the jaw off and reposition it completely. Don't be afraid to completely cut apart your sculpture if something's looking off. You can blend it back together and it will end up looking better in the long run if something is that drastically off. So a few of the tools that I really like to use when doing a large sculpture like this. One of the huge things is rakes. Rakes are super important. If you think about it, rakes are almost like sandpaper for wood because they're what evens out the surface of the sculpture and starts to get rid of the imperfections. Now, having different shapes is super important. Two of my favorites are these Kemper loop tool rakes. This uh, circle and this more kind of flat rake because that gives you a lot of opportunity for different shapes, you know, anywhere where the square might not work, the circle might, and vice versa. And I like to start going into smaller rakes like you would uh, start to switch to a finer grit of sandpaper as you're sanding down whatever your wooden thing is. And for some of the finer grits, I like to use saw blade rakes. Uh, Kemper sells them, I believe. Ken's Tools makes great saw blade rakes. But before the saw blade rakes, I like to use these, which are, uh, you can get these at most sculpture supply places, and I want to say that they're either Kemper or Sculpture House. But they're wire that actually has a secondary thinner wire wrapped around it. And they uh, come in a bunch of different shapes and sizes, and these are just super versatile for starting to hammer in that slightly smaller anatomy once you've got the large shapes taken care of. One of the things that I also really like to use on a large sculpture like this are these. You can find this under the name reticulated foam, stipple sponges, they use them for aquarium filters. My personal preference is the more open celled and coarse, the better. What I like to do is I like to dip these in water once the sculpture has been a little more refined and the surfaces are even and everything's raked down. I dip this in water and use it as an abrasive to really start smoothing the surface out and get it to a good point for being able to accept the texture. Now before that comes along, I'll also take one of these sponges. Now you can use sea sponges, you can use sponges that you might use to wash a car, but these big yellow circular ones are really nice. And these are kind of your finest grit sandpaper, going back to that analogy. So once it's all been abrased, with this, the stipple sponge, I take this and wet it and really start to smooth that out, get all of the scratch marks out, and you can wring this out once you're done doing that and stipple it over the surface, which gives you kind of a base skin texture. I wouldn't call it a final skin texture, but it gives you a really nice base to get started. And I'll keep going back to this while I'm texturing the sculpture and just stipple on top of it. It helps to knock everything down and keep it natural. And this will also help in the production process. When you're doing a rub out, if it's a completely smooth surface, the alcohol on the surface has a tendency to want to drip. But if it has little pores and pockets to break that surface tension, the alcohol won't have a tendency to drip and create weird little drying lines of ink that's collected in those strips. So this can really help for the painting process as well. Now Ed, before he started actually putting the armature on this table, checked and made measurements from a few different heights sitting in different chairs to really think about where the sculpture should be on this table. 
This ended up being great because if I'm standing, I can see it from an upright angle. If I'm sitting, I'm staring face to face with the sculpture and can focus on the face. And if I went to the adjusting chair, I can start to work on the torso. Now this is hugely important because you want to be able to look at the sculpture from as many different angles as possible while you're sculpting it. One problem that I personally have a lot is very flat face sculptures because I spend too much time looking at them head on and not enough time from the side. And as soon as you go to the side, you realize how off it is because the face just feels flat. It doesn't feel like there's enough depth to it. Now, one of the things that's really important with doing monsters or any sort of character is understanding the character. For a good portion of this sculpture, I had a very furrowed brow on him and a snarling lip, and that really did not fit the character. After discussing about this with Ed and Marsha a little bit, we realized he needed to look a lot more stupid because he'd essentially been lobotomized by a mad scientist. And that expression of anger was a little too complicated for someone who'd been lobotomized. So here I'm gonna start making him look a little more stupid and a little more simple. Here you can see I'm using that stipple sponge I was talking about earlier, and you can see how uniform it starts to make the surface. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Really hope that you got something out of this, and stay tuned for more Monster Madness. Let's get a bit on it.